Find balance with Cardia Coaching and Mentoring. We can help you break through the obstacles that hold you back in life through coaching and mentoring, either in a group or on a one-to-one -one basis. Let us help you learn and develop better ways to handle the issues that are standing in the way of your goals. Get the most out of life with our family and relationship coaching. Embrace life's challenges with our career coaching. Our personal improvement and life coaching is perfect for guidance and inspiration. And we can even help children and young people realize their dreams. Add to that personal and professional empowerment sessions in time management, confidence building, and our discovery workshop, and we could help you achieve a more positive outlook on life. But don't just take our word for it. Read some of the glowing testimonials over on our website, cardia-cm.co.uk, where you can also read more about all we offer and schedule a session. Start your journey now at cardia-cm.co.uk. Hello and welcome to Thin Blue Line Radio, our Through the Decades episode for December, where we're going to focus on the Houndsditch murders, which was a catalyst for something well known as the Siege of Sydney Street. This goes back to December 1910 of the 20th century. I'm JP. And I'm Dave. And let's delve right into that story now. So, as we say, back in 1910, there was two forces pretty similar to what it is now. We had the Metropolitan Police, which was Greater London, and then we had Central London, which was policed by the City of London Police. Now, back in de uh, December 1910, um, I think we've covered this before, Dave. We're talking about the earlier 20th century bobber. Mm. Um, so, standard uniform issue uh, consisted trousers for the summer and the winter, uh, a high-collar tunic with brass buttons and a winter great coat, a helmet, cape, belt, boots, and a duty band. And typically that bobby would carry a notebook, a truncheon, uh, and a single locking, non-adjusting derby handcuffs, and a whistle which was suspended from the brass chain from the second button of the officer's tunic. So a lot of the advancements we don't see in today's policing. And even the landscape surrounding them, this is 1910, pre-World War II. So the landscape of London will have changed dramatically following... Well, the Blitz. Yeah. And I think that does that does play... No, it do, I'm not saying it plays a part in it, but it, when you look at the history of it, the, the buildings that we talk about now are not necessarily there. I think the How, main building has gone, hasn't it? The, the yes. actual main Houndsditch building is... Uh, as a result ...obliterated of as a the result Blitz. of the bombing. Um, but yeah, but basically, the, the siege of, uh, of Sydney Streets uh, was January 1911, and it's known as the Battle of Stepney as well, and it's a gunfight that happened in the East end of London between combined police and army force and two Latvian revolutionaries. Now, this was as a result of the story that we're going to particularly focus on, which is uh, the Houndsditch, the Houndsditch murders. Which was the murders of three City of London police officers, which was Sergeants Bentley and Tucker and Constable Choate, who were shot dead whilst trying to prevent a burglary. So at the beginning of 1910, we're talking about a, a, a part of London, uh, as Dave says, was it's, it's, it is slightly different now, the buildings out there now. Uh, but today it's exchange buildings, Hound, Houndsditch no longer exists, uh, uh, as we say, but the street layout remains unaltered. Um, and they say that you can actually follow in the footsteps of the bobbies that night of uh, the, the route that they took and everything's unaltered. You can you can still follow in the footsteps of uh, the, the three officers that night. Now, the force has come a long way uh, and it uh, has changed a great deal. As Dave said, we, the, the, the kit and equipment they had back then is completely... It's not... It's galaxies apart from what we have nowadays, but back then they wouldn't have had, you know, no patrol cars, radios, traffic lights, uh, or even electric street lamps. If I'm right in saying, it would have had, they would have had people that went round and lit the lamps I at night. I believe so... I don't know what time they started going out, but yeah. 1910, surely they would have. Yeah, and I mean, back then, because they used to call London the big... Well, they do now, the big smoke. Yeah. A lot of locals call it the big smoke, which then, when you see these um, dramatised depictions of London in the early 20th century, late 19th mm. century, misty streets, cobblestone, and that's what it was like. That's where the big smoke comes from. Yeah. The industrialness of it and the, 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 the compactness of it. So, yeah, we're talking about 119 Houndsditch. Um, as I say, the building's not there. However, you can still 
take the footsteps uh, of the Bobbies that did. And it would have been just shy of the junction of Cutler Street and Houndsditch that we're going to talk about, uh, which it was uh, a building, a jeweller's shop, that was owned by Henry Samuel Harris, H. Samuels. Mm -hmm. um, and it was alleged that the safe within this uh, building was reputed to hold... Uh, between twenty to thirty thousand pounds worth of jewellery, which doesn't sound like a great deal today, but twenty to thirty thousand pounds in nineteen ten would have been an enormous amount of money. Several, several hundred thousand pounds worth of yeah. jewellery. I would imagine the same store now. If you were going into the safe at H Samuel's, you're looking at millions. Well, yeah, you would, yeah, yeah. And that's um, not just a H Samuel's store. That's a jeweller. A jeweller shop of Henry Samuels in the middle of London. Yeah. So that's where it's going to be their big box. So I'm yeah. going to imagine that's one of their big stars. Now, Harris's son later stated that the total was only around 7,000. And basically, particularly, basically we've got a gang that has targeted this building. And they've said, this is the one that we're going to target. This is the one that we're going to try and, we're going to try and basically rob, rob it. Because they, they tried to rent buildings that were nearby, or I think they tried directly behind, couple, but couldn't get it. Yeah. But they've tried, but they've managed to rent one nearby. Because obviously they've been planning this for a while, because this isn't just a petty theft. This is an actual Latvian gang that it, was operating within the uh, the London boundary at the time. Yeah, yeah, it was. And I mean, I, I mean, thinking about going, I mean, obviously a little bit of a history lesson. Crime levels in 1910, surprising that we've discussed this, haven't we, Dave? And we... We both looked at each other and was like, now nah, that's got to be wrong. I'm going to suggest, kind of, as we've seen in the news recently, well, not recently, but a few years ago, some crimes just aren't being recorded. Yeah. And I'm going to guess back in 1910, it's not like you went back, you loaded up your niche, put in all the crime reports of what's out. I'm going to guess yeah. some of the crimes just weren't. Yeah. It would have been dead easy to see a crime on the street, deal with it unofficially whilst you were there. Yes. And then just not go back and do the paperwork. Uh, because I mean, the, the saying that in 1910 it was lower per thousand of population than they are today. Lower per thousand of the mm. population they are today. I mean, we, the majority of the bobbies back then would have been called to pub brawls, uh, noisy street traders, burglaries, robberies. I'm assuming they would have had priorities, for instance, if there were several robberies in the centre of London, the yeah. City of London police would say, look, gents, make you beat around these jeweler shops, you know what I mean? So they, they, they would have had them priorities. Yeah, because there's, but there's also no phones. It's not like you can ring 101 and 9... Uh, yeah, 101 and 999 yeah. to report anything that happens. There's going to be a lot where it's like, oh, it's not worth bothering the local police. Yeah. I just won't report this. And yeah. then it just won't get recorded. So, of course, crime is going to be lower when there's yeah. not enough technology to report it. Exactly. And, I mean, it, there's even mention that eight homicides per million population in England and Wales in 1910, which made murder extremely rare. But when you think about, I mean, I know we're going off topic slightly, Jack the Ripper and things like that, you, the, the, amount, the amount that you look at in documentaries and films and depictions nowadays, you'd think that it was quite prevalent back then. But that could be because every murder that did happen seen as this big thing yeah because it was so rare so they've gone oh this is a massive case yeah yeah and really it's just it was the only case of that year um so obviously fast forwarding from uh talking about the crime that uh that time obviously we'll, we'll we're gonna go into uh basically the night of the 16th of december 1910 basically the identity of gang members who was there on the night have never been particularly confirmed, corroborated. But um, in the Dictionary of National Biographer, that it basically mentions that in all likelihood, the two people who were identified in that were, were the one who shot the policemen who interrupted the burglary. Because I believe they've just been around the general area, with it being London, and they've heard a lot of banging and drilling coming from the address. Yeah. And just nipped in to see what's going on. On the 16th of December, working from a small yard, like you say, Dave, just behind 11 exchange buildings, the gang began to break through the back wall of the shop. Now, we're thinking about the kit that the Bobbies had. What kit to break through that wall would the offenders have had? You would, immediately, your mind would get drawn to hand-powered tools, wouldn't they? So yeah. the likes of drills where you've got, and I'm probably showing my age here, where you've got the actual drill tool and the little 
circular handle next to it that you roll around to drill into things. Gonna imagine that they're not gonna have been armed with power tools and a pneumatic drill. Could have been quite simplistic yeah. in the design, aren't they? Sledgehammers, little hand drill, well, probably bigger hand drills, yeah. things like that. Because um, with them being a gang at the time, I'm gonna imagine they probably had the time, the preparation and the money to get as good a stuff as you could get for the time. And like you said, Dave, they, they tried to rent buildings around. So they've mm. they've moved around, they've looked at what's better, they've looked at the kit that they've had to see, well, this building's better, we can't get that one, yeah. well, that building's got something. And they've clearly got the money behind them if they can just run exactly. rent some of these buildings yeah. in the middle of London. Uh, so around 10 o'clock that evening, returning to his home, which was at 120 hounds ditch, Max Wheel has heard curious noises coming from his neighbour's property, 119. Um, now, outside his house, uh, Wheeler's found police constable Piper on his beat and he's basically said, excuse me, officer, I can hear some weird noises coming from next door. Piper's basically checked at 118 and 121 um, Houndsditch where he could hear the noise, which he thought was unusual enough to investigate further. Then at 11 o'clock, he's knocked at the door of 11 exchange buildings, the only property with a light on in the back. Uh, now, the door was opened uh, in a furtive manner. And Piper's become suspicious immediately. Now, not to obviously cause concern and to, you know, to rouse any ruckus or anything like that. The officer's basically said, is the missus in? Uh, and the man has answered in broken English and said, oh, she's out. So the policeman said, okay, no worries, I'll return later. Um, and he's left exchange buildings to return to Houndsditch, um, where he saw a man acting sus in the shadows of the cul-de-sac. But as he's approached the man, uh, he's later described as being approximately 5'7", pale and fair-haired. Uh, he's reached Houndsditch, saw two policemen from adjoining beats. Uh, which was Constables Woodhams and Walter Choate. Uh, they've watched 120 Houndstitch and 11 exchange buildings while Piper went to the nearby Bishopgate police station to complete the report. And then it's only 11.30 where seven uniformed and two plainclothes policemen have gathered in the locality. So clearly at this point, all the bobbies have started thinking, there's something going on here. Yeah. They might not know exactly what it is, but there's, there's enough sauce here that well, they don't want to deal with it on their own. Let's so get resources into yeah, the Yeah, he's area. gone back, done a bit of a report, got a few more bobbies down um, so that they can actually deal with it now. safely. Well, <laughs> safely. They've obviously gathered in the locality uh, and each have been armed with the wooden truncheon. So this is where Sergeant Rob Bentley from Bishopsgate Police Station has basically knocked on number 11 again, unaware that Piper had just knocked on it. Yeah. Or previously knocked on it. So now um, even the gang inside the door will be thinking... They're now alert. No, this, this isn't just a call to see if my missus is in. Something's going on here. Yeah. The police are on to us. Now, the door was answered by one of the gang members who made no response when Bentley asked if anyone was working there. Um, and basically, Bentley said, can you fetch someone who spoke English? So the, the offender's left the door half closed and he's gone inside. So Bentley's entered the hall with Sergeant Bryant and Constable Woodhams and as they could see the bottom of his trouser legs, they soon realised that someone was watching them from the stairs. So the police has asked the man if they could step into the back of the property um, and he, he's basically said, yeah, yeah, no problem. So Bentley's moved forward um, and the back door opened and one of the gang has exited firing a pistol. Yeah, it's like, come in, everything's fine. Yeah, come in, officer. And then as soon as they've got into a place where they're too far in to immediately withdraw to a safe place, these guys have just jumped out and started shooting, which is, is curious because the three officers that is that have walked in, um, only one of them is listed as our deceased. Yes, uh, because as, the, as this guy has obviously exited firing from a pistol, the bloke on the stairs that they'd noticed watching him has also started firing. Now, Bentley was been shot in the shoulder and the neck. Now, the second round severed his spine. So you can imagine that Bentley would have dropped where yeah. he stood Instantly. immediately. Now, Bryant got shot in the arm and the chest and Woodhams was only wounded in the leg. Uh, but that did break his femur. So both of them bobbies have now collapsed. And although they 
was severely injured at the time, uh, they did survive but didn't fully recover from their injuries. Which, to be fair, if you've been shot in the femur, which is, is that the biggest and strongest bone in your body and that's shattered, yeah, yeah. that's never going to fully heal. Especially with the, the type of bullets and ammunition you've got back in the day, because I imagine that didn't stay in one piece when it went into it. That would have. I'm caused... thinking about the medical side of things as well, the, what would have been available to them then. Yeah, yeah. It's not like you, yeah, get them on the operating table, let's do keyhole surgery and get all of the frack now. Yeah. You don't get that kind of treatment in 1910. Yeah. So obviously, as you can imagine, I mean, being stood there and hearing bang, 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 all these shots, and then you, you just basically see Bobby's fall collapse out of the door you you yeah. look into so basically the gang has exited the property um, and they've basically started to escape up the oldest up the cul-de-sac yeah but obviously um, there's other police that have been waiting outside because they've just gathered all the resources to come in yeah um and that's where people have started trying to other coppers have tried to start uh, intervening so then we've got charles tucker the sergeant from bishop's gate at this point he's been hit twice once in the hip and once in the heart um and he has literally died instantly and Choate has then grabbed one of them and wrestled for his gun, but he's managed to shoot him in the leg. Um, and then other members have ran to this fella's, because I believe the fella that Choate was wrestling with was the actual leader of the gang. Mm -hmm. So obviously when he's being wrestled with by police, all the members of the gang have come to try and help. I've ended up shooting him 12 times in the process. 12 times? 12 times. Um, the gang leader has then been carried away, leaving Cho, Constable Choate, um, basically to die in the street. He's just literally collapsed where he where he stood. Yeah, <sighs> unbelievable. And obviously, as these as these men of it, you know, they've been aid, aided by an unknown woman. They've made their escape, um, but they were accosted by uh, Isaac Levy, who's a passerby, and they've basically threatened him with pistol point, and he was the only witness to the escape who was able to provide firm details um, because other witnesses just said, yeah, we're a group of men and a woman, um, but we just thought one of the men was drunk and he was being helped by his friends. So when you when you think about that, it's just, you don't really pay attention to you because you turn, you look and you think, what's going on over there? Oh, they're just helping the blood, but move yeah. away. But when you're privy to something, you pay more particular attention. This is why Levy or Levy, um, has basically paid more attention and been able to give firm details. Mm -hmm. So other policemen have arrived in Houndsditch, began to attend to the wounded, collected bodies into taxis to take them to the London Hospital, which is now the London Royal Hospital on Whitechapel Road. Choke was also taken there where he was being operated on, but at 5.30am on the 17th of December, he did unfortunately pass away. So Bentley... Um, was taken to St. Bartholomew's Hospital um, and he was half conscious on arrival. Um, but he recovered enough to be able to have a conversation with his pregnant wife uh, and answer questions about the events, which I would have thought would have give quite specific information for the officers to be able to investigate further. Yeah. Um, and to be honest, I had overlooked when I've been reading through the information uh, the fact that it was his pregnant wife, which makes a tragic incident all the more tragic. Yeah. Um, and unfortunately, at uh, 6.45pm on the 17th of December, his condition worsened and he died at 7.30pm. Um, to complete the, one of the largest multiple murders of police officers carried out in Britain in peacetime. Obviously, the investigation kicks in then. So between the 17th of December 1910 and the 2nd of January 1911, obviously, as we've already discussed, this sort of was the catalyst for the siege of Sydney Street. Um, and obviously, we're paying particular attention to the tragic killings of these officers. Uh, but obviously, in that ruckus where people were shot 12 times, um, some of the gang members were injured as well. And I know that um, one of the, the, the main... The main himself. offenders, the leader himself, leader himself, yeah, was was found deceased, um, and, and I think it's literally just it's been a catalyst for people starting to manoeuvre themselves away from house it because you would it would have been foot patrols and investigation. Yeah. There would have been a lot of police activity around there. Then on the twenty second December, a public memorial service took place for uh, Tucker, Bentley, and Chote at St Paul's Cathedral, uh, and Ch King George V was represented by Edward Wallington. 
uh, his groom in waiting. Now, Winston Churchill uh, and the Lord Mayor of London were also uh, present. Uh, and again, going into what we always discuss every time we talk about an officer killed in the line of duty, the crime shocked Londoners and the, 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 the service showed evidence of the feelings. An estimated 10,000 people waited um, and local businesses closed as a mark of respect. And the London Stock Exchange ceased trading for half an hour to allow traders and staff to watch the procession along Threadneedle Street. Um, now, the coffins were being transported on an eight-mile journey to the cemeteries, and it was an estimated that 750,000 people lined the route, and many of them throwing flowers onto the hearses as they passed. Again, just an outpouring of grief. I can't even imagine the London Stock Exchange closing for that long now. Yeah. That would cause uproar everywhere. Um, the fact that they've just gone, do you know what? It needs to be done, because that needs to be the respect that we pay to these officers. Yeah. Um, uh, and obviously, as we said, there's, there's obviously many people are being injured because this is this this stretches right into January. Um, and then obviously we've got, um, just after midnight on the 3rd of January, 200 police officers from the City of London and the Met Forces cordoned off the area around 100 Sydney Street. This is where the last remaining members of this gang have basically hold themselves up. Yeah, and um, they were never going to come quietly. No, absolutely not. So the siege started and... I believe it was just a massive gunfight between the police and these this gang. Yeah. And the army, I think that some of the army were drawn in, weren't they? Yeah, army and police forces. And I think, if my memory serves me correctly, the Metropolitan Police informed the City of London Police, look, as per our policy because of what's going on, and we're giving all our coppers sidearms. Yeah. So everyone was given a pistol mm -hmm. to be able to deal with this incident, not in general. Yeah, just... Just to deal with yeah. this incident. And Winston Churchill even went to Sydney Street during the siege. Oh, did he? He, he actually went to scene, yeah. Um, now, the siege was captured, believe it or not, and you can find this if you Google it, because uh, it's extremely interesting. Uh, it was captured uh, by Pathé News, uh, and one of the early stories in the first siege to be captured on film, and it even included footage of, uh, of Churchill um, being there. Um, Newsreels were screened in cinemas and Churchill was booed with shouts of shoot him from audiences. So you can imagine that there's still that uh, level of utter respect for a government. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, we've then got um, the legacy of um, the siege of Sydney Street. As we say, the Houndsditch, which, which then moved on to Sydney Street, an inquest was held into January into the death of the Houndsditch, uh, and the jury took 15 minutes to reach the conclusion uh, that the two bodies located were those of the offenders uh, that Tucker Bentley and, and that Tucker Bentley and Chort had been murdered by the main guy who was found deceased, I think, a, a couple of days later. Yeah. In the burglary attempt. Um, a couple was arrested in February, um, I think the first week and the second week. Um, and in March 1911, um, the proceedings of consisted of 24 individual hearings, um, and there was insufficient evidence for some people. So you know, people were uh, were discharged. Um, but the, the the four remaining arrested gang members was heard at the Old Bailey, um, and. Pause, 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 pause. That case, or the case, uh, lasted for 11 days. Now, there were problems with the proceedings because of the language difficulties and the chaotic personal lives of the accused, but the case resulted in acquittals for all except uh, one who was convicted of conspiracy in the burglary and sentenced to two years' imprisonment. Um, but her conviction was overturned on appeal. So this led to a lot of um, criticism throughout the media of the uh, the actual firepower of the police. So obviously something like this happens and you've got police who, who aren't really armed with much to, to mm -hmm. combat any of this. Um, on January the 12th, 1911, um, several alternative weapons were tested, which resulted in the Met replacing their Webley revolver 
with the Webley and Scott 32 caliber MP semi-automatic pistol, um, which was then adopted by the City of London Police as well in 1912. So basically, the aftermath of it and, and what actually came of it was that the police weren't adequately prepared mm -hmm. for the firepower that gangs and gang members had at the time. Yeah. So it kind of pushed the police to move forward with... As, as we all... There's a lot of comments, isn't there, where if one side of a fight becomes more heavily armed, it leads the other side to become more heavily armed. Mm -hmm. And this is just the case of the criminals got more heavily armed, so the police have gone, well, we need better guns then. Yeah, um, and I, I, as we all as we all know, when when these things happen, um, memorials, uh, contemporary memorials to the members of the police and the fire service, because I believe part of Sydney Street, um, as we said, there was massive gun battles. The police and the the, the army was involved, but obviously because of the fires and the, I think that the gang was setting fires and things like that. I think a fireman was actually. Um, was actually shot and killed in the the, the fire that come from the uh, the occupants of Sydney Street, uh, but yet yeah, the plaque in Sydney Street to Charles Pearson, the fireman who died from his injuries, uh, as well as the memorial prat to uh, memorial prat. <laughs> <laughs> as well as the memorial plaque to the three policemen murdered. Uh, in Houndsditch, uh, they are there to this day. As I say, you can go down, follow the footsteps. I think there is like a bronze tower with the plaques in front of it, from what I've seen of the pictures. I think there's like a little tower at the back. Yeah. And then in front of it is the three separate plaques for the three officers. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and as you say, you can go down there um, and you can have a look at them. But obviously, the, the further back that we go, uh, we have discussed this. Um, all three of us have discussed the further back that we go there's some cases which were massively massively in the media and there's some that's not so massively in the media um and it's very difficult to get a hold of information to have information that's 100 percent fact there's a lot of assumptions in these cases the further back you go because you know, the, the retaining of information and the retaining of evidence was very, very few yeah. and far in between. And the, I believe the whole events inspired a few films and novels, but obviously they become very dramatised. It changes a lot of events that have happened. It, it, it skews. And because they're based on these events, a lot of people read them or watch them going, oh, so that's what happened. When in reality, no, that's not what happened but it makes a better book or a better story. Yeah, and as Dave says, uh, the, the, on the anniversary of the siege, a plot was unveiled in honour of, the, the, uh, of Pierce and the fireman uh, who died because of the buildings uh, that collapsed on him. Um, so obviously the, the, the barrage of bullets, the fires, the weakness of, of the structure, it's just unfortunate that um, it, it had such a drastic effect on the emergency services back then. Yeah. Thank you for joining us, and we'd like to extend a thank you to Charles Pearson, the uh, fireman who lost his life during the siege, and a thank you to all of the emergency services that ended up with ended up be, being involved in this incident and um, having to go through what was a horrific incident. Yeah, and, and lastly, by no means least, a special thank you to Sergeant Robert Bentley, Sergeant Charles Tucker and Police Constable Walter C. Chote for your ultimate sacrifice in protecting the vulnerable and serving your communities. Always remembered, never forgotten.